Jimmy Bratcher is with us today. Show him a little bit of love. Not, he's not coming up just yet. But, uh, and Sherry's with us this time, too. We love Sherry. Y'all haven't really got to meet Sherry yet, but we're glad they're here. Make sure you get some of their stuff on the way out. He'll, he'll tell you about it. He's got rubs, barbecue rubs. We'll, we'll talk about that. We thought we'd do something a little bit different today where we would do kind of an interview type style. We'll sit down and, and have a conversation and uh, you know talk about the ministries that they're involved in and then also um, give you an opportunity to ask some questions if something comes up. But first, you can come on up here. He's going to play some music for us. <laughs> Jimmy is a world-renowned blues artist. Can I say that? You got you got a number one record. Is it still trending number one right no, now? No, it's, it was. Uh, it was. It was in the top ten or the top ten. Top for ten. Seven weeks. It made okay. It number three, and then it was on the charts for um, uh, the fifty top contemporary blues albums for six months. Nice. So he's got a couple songs for us. Um, I, I always forget to tell you to bring that, uh, is it the Weisenborg? How do you say that? The Weisenborg or the Resonator? Oh, the Resonator. The metal one? That thing is just, uh, I, next time you come, you have to bring that and do at least one song with that. Okay. Because I, I love the sound of that thing. All right. Yeah. In fact... Least, I guess that means I'm coming back. Well, sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, in fact, you're responsible for uh, Johnny and Kathy being here. We were talking about that yeah. a little bit last night. They um, met in a church. You guys were long, you guys were in Florida. They were praying over you guys. He was happened to be at your church, and they, you said you were moving to Noonan. And uh, Jimmy said, "Well, you got to go here." So that's cool. We're glad. Yeah. And here you are. Yeah. <laughs> so appreciate you, man. Thank you. Show him some love. <laughs> Well, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm glad Sherry's here with me so that you all can validate the stories I told about her when I was here before. You know, one of the things I love about the Lord is that, um, and I don't know if you do this, but in the morning when I wake up, I try to make one of my first thoughts that I have new mercy. And because uh, his, mer his mercies are new, I almost said nurses, his mercies are new every morning. And so I try to train myself that when I wake up, it's like, this is different than yesterday. This is today. And uh, so if you need mercy, he's got it. All right, boys. We'll see if the band shows up. They did, but there's no track. Can I tell you a story from not too long ago, the track, about a man whose life was wrecked, he couldn't take it anymore, when it seemed all was lost, one night down on his knees, no place left to turn. there anyone out there who would care for a sinner like me? One whose life is all undone, full of pain and misery. If there's someone out there, would you please answer me right now? Deep within, these words seem to comfort Babies by her side. She lost her love, now she fights just to get by. She does her best, but it seems at times her best just ain't good enough. And on her knees at night in prayer, she finds everlasting love.
when it seems that all is lost and there's no place you can go there is one who's always there forgiveness he will show and if you look you'll see his arms i'm waiting for you now and with kindness in his voice you can Thank you so much. You think? Do a whole show? We could do that. Well, Sherry asked that I play uh, a song that I, I don't have a track for it back there, but it kind of fits in. So Clint mentioned that, you know, our last album, which was a little bit unique in that uh, I have written several songs about food. And so, uh, so I kept joking. It's like, I'm going to do a whole album of songs about food. And uh, then somebody said, well, why don't you, you know, you cook all the time. I'm always grilling and stuff. And so why don't you do a cookbook? And I'm like, okay. And so we sent the word out to our friends and family, and we came up with this super fabulous 196-page cookbook called I'm Hungry. And so it's got keto, paleo, uh, Southwestern. Brenda Richards got some recipes in here. Uh, my friend Mark Gunger from Green Bay, he put one in here called uh, Old Fashioned Pizza Exactly the Way You Want It. And so the recipe is um, you decide what you want on the pizza, you decide the type of crust you want on the pizza, and then you call your pizza place and they'll deliver it, and t you know, it'll be exactly the way you want it. So, whenever Sherry asks me to play a song, I usually do. So, what's that? That's a real good idea. They really like this song in France. I, I don't know what it is, but the French just went nuts over this song. There's something in the breeze is blowing through the trees Shakes me to the core Oh, I want it more Takes me back home From wherever I roam I remember it well Every time I smell that smell, I smell bacon. Bacon is on my mind. I don't know how biblically correct this is, but I smell bacon. I got to have it all the time. Y'all know what I'm talking about. It sticks to the walls and all down the hall. It'll wake you in your bed. It may even raise the dead. It's quiet as a mouse. Still, you know when it's in the house. When it comes creeping round, all the big dogs start to howl. I smell bacon. Bacon. 
Bacon is on my mind I smell bacon Oh, I got to have it All the time mm, I need me some right now Clint didn't fix me no breakfast I smell bacon to heaven all the time Whoa. So this next song is the saddest song I've ever written in my life and um, it's you know so if y'all got antidepressants, now's a good time to take them. And it's a true story. So that's what makes it even worse. And uh, so anyway, we'll play it for you. Go ahead, guys. Yeah, there you go. I went to the doctor the other day. The doc said, boy, you got to quit eating that way. You got to cut out the cheese and the fried foods. I said, doc, what's a brother supposed to do? I went home and I told my wife, big mistake. She said, baby, you're going to take his advice cause we can't have you sick and feeling bad. You're not going to like it, but don't be sad cause mama won't fry no chicken. Mama won't fry no chicken. There ain't going to be no finger licking cause mama won't fry no chicken. Sometimes when I'm by myself, I get tempted and I can't resist. I drive by churches, Popeyes, and KFC, then stop and go chicken, go and get a piece of sweet tea. Because mama won't fry no chicken. Mama won't fry no chicken. There ain't gonna be no finger licking. Cause mama won't fry no chicken Maybe your fried chicken is the best I've ever had And to live without it, it just makes me mad So pull out the skillet, throw some dark meat in the pan And make me some gravy, and I'll be a happy man But mama won't fry no chicken won't fry no chicken. There ain't gonna be no finger licking. Cause mama won't fry no chicken. No, mama won't fry no chicken. Mama won't fry no chicken. There ain't gonna be no finger licking. Cause mama won't fry no chicken. Oh, come on, baby. Fry me some chicken. I need me some dark meat, some biscuits, and some gravy. Mm. Mighty fine. I don't want no mashed potatoes, though. Those are for old people.
All right, all right. We'll get the stage reset here. Y'all appreciate that? Is that fun? <laughs> we'll grab these chairs here. Cool. Reese, will you grab one of those chairs over there? Chicken and bacon. Chicken wrapped in bacon. <laughs> well, just so you all, thank you, sir. So we'll sanctify this. Chicken is considered to be the gospel bird. Just <laughs> so you all know. I mean, Appreciate you. This is home of Chick Fil A. We go. Yeah, oh, chick that's right. We got God's chicken here, right? <laughs> oh no. That's what we call it, God's chicken. You do. Chick Fil A. Hardly ever. Is this is that. this good? This is good. Y'all all right with this? Lines. How y'all doing online? Some of my folks yep. uh, from our stream, yeah. I'm sure, came over to watch this morning. So, Which you stream. We'll just kind of dance around here. Tell us where, okay. where you stream from. You you do a lot of stuff online. I, well, I didn't until March of 2020. Well, yeah. And then, uh, you know, Wonder we're why. all forced to go online. I actually started streaming uh, four nights a week. How y'all doing over here in the cheap seat? Y'all want to move over here? There's like something wrong with these front rows. It's like they don't want to be on camera. Is that what? It's it funny. Is? I've had they're people. High. I've had people message. They're like, "Can you show some shots of your church? We want to see you." I'm like, "Listen, there's people here. They just don't sit in the front row." Yeah, I don't know what it is. I about spit. That. I spit it's when like I preach. It's like the cheap seats back there. You know, like those are all. It didn't cost any more for you to like sit up here. You know, it's like it's not like going to see Garth or something. I have been to churches where they will beat you up for sitting in the back row. Well, when we were the anointing, you know, the anointing. Well, they uh, say it's stronger in the front. Some of them. It is, but we used to have to like we would like when we Sherry and I were on church on staff at a large church, and we would like assign people. The big givers was, up front. No, oh. wasn't big givers, but just pretty people, beautiful oh. people. Oh. You know, I don't. You know. That ain't right. They're all beautiful, but that was they they were wrong. So, so you stream online. I stream online. So I started doing four nights a week. And then after things kind of got back to reasonable, I, we just do uh, Sunday morning at 8 a.m. Central. So it'd be nine here. And then Wednesday at six Central. So seven here. Okay. And I, you know, I do a variety of things. I'll cook. Uh, we're just getting ready to kind of up our production. So we'll do some remote stuff, different locations around Kansas City. So I'm from, we're from Kansas City. So we got to hurry up and get out of here because we got a football game going on here a little bit. So, well, you know, it only takes 13 seconds. Just, I'm just saying. Well, really, if you watch that game, but, but we, you know, I, I feel you because this year we got the Braves won the World Series. I didn't even know there was a World Series. Well, I'm I'm well, that's because your Royals, y'all won it a couple of years ago. Yeah. And the dogs finally took the national championship. I know, so. man. That was shocking. Everybody in shocking. Alabama. Well, I mean, it was shocking for the people in Listen, Alabama. Listen, we might not have you back. For the Alabama people, it was shocking. Just don't, don't throw me under the bus <laughs> until I get to finish the conversation. So you the Alabama me. folks were all, they were like, they had the blues. Well, you missed my joke from last week. Which was... Are you going to tell it again? Did you, did you hear it? Uh-uh. Well, I, I mean, I, I heard that the number one dating app in Alabama is Ancestry.com. <laughs> okay. We're going from here to Alabama, so... <laughs> we love our Alabama people. It's a, I'll remember that. Yeah. So, yeah, we started streaming, and the interesting thing is that my number one audience is Kansas City, of course. My number two audience is Kathmandu, Nepal, and my number three audience is Bangladesh. So it's like, I don't know how that happens, but they must like the blues and, you know, Kathmandu or something. So. You are, and we'll talk about this, you, uh, you, you are primarily an evangelist, right? I mean, that, that's kind of how I see y'all's ministry, evangelistic, going into places that the church n n normally go or can't get into, yeah, reaching we, people that, you know, won't normally go to church. and right. So, you know, we've been... Before, before that, oh. how did we meet? We met in Huntsville, in Alabama. Right. At, uh, at Impact. That's when you and Sarah were dating. Yeah. I'm kidding. <laughs> 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 that was before Ancestry. No. Yeah. Uh, but... <laughs> <laughs> you met where? We met at Georgia. Oh, did you? Yeah, yeah. We met in Athens in, okay. in both. Right. Yeah. 
Uh, <laughs> we met at Jim's place, Jim Richards, right. Impact Impact Ministries. Right. Um, you had, I guess, newly kind of stepped out of working for a church, and I, th yeah. this is my perception of it. Maybe you can give kind of the short version. You, my understanding is you were working at a church, you had the passion of music, you were a musician, you grew up, you got stuffy. You realized you needed to Stuffy. get out of it. I mean, y'all were legalistic, right? Y'all were legalistic well, yeah, church, I mean, and, we, we came and then Jesus. you decided we're actually going to do this thing of right. some heart. Yeah, we came to Jesus in 76, and so, yeah, I've told that story here before, so for those of you that weren't here, so Sherry and I, we met at a Black Sabbath concert, <laughs> and we were both tripping. I couldn't tell if she was really that beautiful or if I was hallucinating, and uh <laughs> And we got married, she got pregnant, we got married, and three years into the marriage, my grandmother paid for our divorce. That's, That's bad pretty bad. So we have a book back there called Granny Paid for Our Divorce. <laughs> and uh, and so, we, the, so we decided about nine months later that we were going to get married again. Of course, we couldn't tell my grandmother because she wanted her money back. <laughs> and, uh, Refund. But we stumbled into a little church in northwest Missouri in the smallest populated county in the state. Uh, the church's name was God Sheep Shed, so you can't make that stuff up. And uh, and the only way the pastor would marry us was if I gave my life to Jesus. And so we, you know, planted in that church. Uh, you know, we were completely transformed immediately. Uh, you know, spontaneously, it was it was death to life. You know, transition. Yeah. And uh, we stayed in that church for 16 years. Raised our kids there. The church turned very legalistic. And one of the first things the pastor told me was, yeah, you got hit to tithe. And I said, what's that? And he says, that's the first 10% of what you make. And my response to him was, yeah, and you're crazy, <laughs> you know? And, uh, and the second thing he told me was, you have to quit playing that devil music. Mm. And so for 20 years- Because you were obviously a musician yeah, then. Yeah, I was a musician. And, uh, and, I, and at that time, I was more interested in following Jesus than playing music. Mm. And so we, you know, I continued to play, but it was only, you know, sanctified music. And so we, uh, we did that. And then when we left there in 1994, uh, we went to a, a large church in St. Joseph, Missouri, and we were in the top 20 fastest growing churches in America through the 90s. Jim, and, uh, I hate to interrupt, but they say on here that you, they can't hear you all. Okay. Somebody online. Well, bring him up on the live stream. Okay, I'll hold the mic up. How's that? But they can bring can him up both. too. Yeah. So, thank so you. So anyway, we went to a large church there, um, and Sherry and I were both on staff there. I was a senior associate pastor, um, and you know that church was rocking. Uh, a lot of people coming to Jesus. And you weren't playing. I was not playing. I mean, very little. I would. Do Did maybe, you miss it during that time? You know, it was always part of who I was. Uh, but it wasn't. But you had short hair. Yeah, I posted a picture on my Facebook page this week of <laughs> that. You know what, what I look like coming out of there. It was shorter than your hair. Oh, yeah. And uh, I was legit. I had to wear a suit seven days a week. Wow. A uh, suit and tie. I had to at least have a jacket on any time I came to the office. And but that, but it was the nineties. I mean, it was, that was the kind 90s, of the Yeah. Church but, was different. But um, that church became very performance based, and so it was all about the performance, and so. We decided that uh, in the in the um, fall of 1998, um, the Lord spoke to me and said, "Can you do this for the rest of your life?" And I said, "Yes," because we were very successful, good salary, good benefits. And then He said, "And be happy." Mm -hmm. And I said, "No." Uh, and so Sherry and I started to. We figured we'd pastor a church. I mean, we had the resume to do that. And so we, for a year and a half, we looked for a church and uh, didn't find anything. And so we set a date of March 1st, 2000. We would uh, leave the staff there and let them go ahead and restaff, which for the two of us, it took four to replace. And, uh, and then we started, really didn't know where, what we were doing or what we were gonna do. So we were on this journey. You know, I tell people, it's like, if you've seen the picture footprints, y'all seen that picture where it's like there's two sets of footprints and then there's one. And the guy says, why was there only one there? And the Lord says, well, that's when I was carrying you. Our, our picture of footprints looks like this. There's one set of footprints and two ruts where the Lord is dragging this <laughs> into, 
into his purpose, you know. And so we just started out just uh, we're doing everything that we could find. Um, and uh, and then through that, through those steps, then, you know, we just kind of walked into what we do now. So so you laid down what you love, thinking right. you were doing the right thing. And, and you know, you did, did good work. Raised our kids, you know. Did. But then the music thing came back around. Because, you know, what I'm... What I'm interested in maybe having you speak to a little bit. I know you got a book called Don't Take Your Dreams to the Grave. Right. And you got a workbook for that. So right. we recommend that. JimmyBratcher.com or you can get it here yeah. today. Uh, but so I mean what what were some of the internal questions and dialogue decision processes to, you know, to pick back up the guitar to start doing this thing? Because that was something that I remember when Jim, you and Jim met, right. I was I was on staff with him at the time and he came back and was talking about met this guy and he's incredible guitarist and he's starting to kind of move back this direction again and and you know so because we got people sitting here that are on that fence you know i'm not recommending people quit their jobs but if you really feel like the lord's poking you in your heart to to really move towards something that you can that can be done right talk to that a little bit well you know looking back you yeah know, so looking from this perspective the thing that we learned was that we, so we had this dream. So I have a book about dreams, you know, don't take your dreams to the grave. And, uh, which is a great title. I mean, don't take your dreams to the grave. You can just kind of sit and meditate on that a yeah, little bit. I mean, and it's inspiring. It's shocking. Yeah. You know, because you look at, it, especially when you get a few miles on you. But, um, but when I look back, the thing that was so important was that, um, we, you know, we had this idea of what our dreams were, but we had these opportunities that were in front of us. And so we, we you know, and looking back over our whole life in church and everything else for 45 years, um, we, I found that, you know, the opportunities were the key to the dreams. And so we started... The opportunities were the key to the dreams. Right. So in other words, instead of praying, God, give me some blueprint that manifests down from heaven... Right. You just kind of started walking through open doors or... Sure. Yeah. You know, when when Sherry and I came to Jesus, with December 19th, 1976, you know, people say, well, when were you called into ministry? It's like, well, I don't remember a moment mm. from that time forward that I didn't want to do something for Jesus. Mm. And so right after Christmas in 76, that, you know, we were obviously out in the country, so we heated the church with wood. And so they were having, a, men were having a work day. And so it's like, I want to do something for Jesus. So I'm going to show up, cut wood. And so I walk in, I walk up, you know, we're out in this field, cut, or out in these woods cutting wood. And, and I walk up to this old farmer and I'm like, I'm here to help. Where's the chainsaw? He goes, son, you just coming off drugs. You don't get no chainsaw. <laughs> <laughs> That's wisdom right there. And so he said, here, move that pile of brush over here. So I had the brush ministry. So I started moving brush. And then when it got warm, uh, we discovered there was an indoor manifestation of the brush ministry. And so for seven years, Sherry and I cleaned the bathrooms in the church. <laughs> so we had the toilet brush, you know. And uh, I developed a nice intercessory prayer ministry and would say, you know, every time I knelt down before the throne, I would say, Lord, there's got to be some elder deacon that needs this ministry more than me. <laughs> But so we just started, following, you know, Sherry, we had a small Christian school. And so we arranged our finances in such a way so that Sherry could donate her time full time to teach in that school. And so she taught that for 12 years and I led worship for eight years. And uh, and just, you know, it was it's back to those things. So our verse for this year is Exodus 4, 2, which is Moses at the burning bush. And the question the Lord asked him was, what's in your hand? Mm -hmm. And so we just started Because Moses is sitting there like, what, what do I do? How do I do this? I'm not sure who you are. I don't think I can do this. How do I get started? Right. And that's the question God says. Yeah. Well, all right, if you're going to go that route, what you got in your hands there? Right. Yeah. And he's like, my, my version is, he goes, well, I got this stick. I yeah. mean, I don't, you know, what do I do with it? Yeah, you throw it down. Yeah. You know, and uh, so we just have used what we had. And so the music thing came about, you know, when like we were doing our exit interview at the church and the senior pastor said, look, I know you want to do this music thing, but don't. And it was just more of the same, you know, thing. But 
I mean, don't didn't listen to him. I mean, his analogy can you was preaching guys get paid, music guys don't. Oh, it's, so it's financial. Yeah. Mm, that's unfortunate. You know, so, but it was still in my heart. And so we just, you know, we started the process of, of doing that. So I was invited to Macon, Georgia um, in 2001 to do an album with a guy, Larry Howard, who's a Southern rock founder, played a band called Grinder Switch. And uh, so they like they were the opening band for the Almond Brothers and uh, Charlie Daniels and Marshall Tucker and all the Southern rock guys. So we came to Macon, I recorded two albums there. And, uh, and that was the beginning. So it's like, you know, I had to write the songs. I wasn't a songwriter, uh, but I was using what I had, yeah. you know? And so we, we started. And then how many records have you recorded total? Twelve. Twelve? Yeah. Since 2001. Mm -hmm. Wow. And yeah. there's some great stuff on there. Um, I, you know, I always, when I think of you, I always think of Get Out the Boat. Yeah. I'm sure that's one that's of your big a, ones. Yeah, most popular song. Talking yeah. about, singing about Peter, getting out the boat, inspiring. Yep. Today were, was kind of more fun songs, but you have, you have, most of your records you have, you know, gospel focused and. Yeah, uh, some of the others, like in 2005, I recorded an album called Red, which Mercy, the song I say is on that and the Lord's, I, I felt the Lord speak to me and he said, I want you to write in parables. Mm. So concepts, you know, like in, in mercy, you know, like I'm teaching about the mercy. I'll sing that. We play that all the time in clubs and festivals and, and things like that. So I'm continuing to communicate the message just in a way that's not as literal. Yeah. So I'm not standing up there doing praise and worship. I'm playing songs that teach like, I wrote a song uh, for Sherry called, uh, it's on Secretly Famous, the Secretly Famous album. Secretly Famous. <laughs> called, uh, It Just Feels Right. Mm. And so it's a song, we have a, Sherry and I had a confession because, you know, we had obviously been divorced, like we went through the whole court, child support, everything. And, um, and so one of the things that we did when we were recovering from that, uh, after we came to Jesus, we developed a confession. And so when things got bad, uh, we had this confession. You know, we'd be in the middle of a fight and one of us would have a lapse of sanity. And, uh, and we just look at each other and say, there's no plan B. Uh -huh. It's me and you all the way. Uh -huh. And so that was our, our confession. And yeah. so I wrote about that in that particular song. Uh -huh. So, you know, it just feels right. It's me, you know, it says, the line says, it's it's you and me, baby, I've got no other plans. Where do I sign? Nobody's gonna change my mind. Mm. It just feels right. Mm. And so I can teach that concept yeah. in a non-church setting for people that still have the same struggles that everybody else does. Which is primarily where you play. So primarily you're in prisons. Right. And you play bars, yes, and uh, other events. I mean, you, you do Sturgis. you do a lot of you do a lot of churches, huh? Sturgis, Sturgis. Uh, yeah, just kind of maybe give it a little bit of overview of where you've played, who you've shared the stage with, okay. some of the highlights in that. Some, yeah, you know, the, and, then, uh, and then we'll go into the the prison ministry. Okay, stuff. so um, I had written, I'd done my first two albums, and don't forget to tell about Sturgis when. Easy would take those CDs okay. out to the outlaws. All right, so uh, I did my first two albums, and uh, the ba the guy co-wrote "Get Out the Boat," the song "Get Out the Boat," a guy named Jeff Allenberg, and Jeff was a uh, meth manufacturer. Meth so, manufacturer, right. Break, breaking bad type stuff. I don't know. I never watched that. I'm sanctified. I okay. Watch that stuff. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> or for those of you old folks, I call it sanctified. So. You, and uh, so Jeff, he they got him and his wife got busted, and uh, sent to federal prison. Mm. And uh, when he got out of prison, so he went to prison, you know, and he told the story. He was this little short guy, had his real gruff voice, sang like Bob Seger, and um, he would say, "Yeah, he said I, I went to prison, and and when I was in prison one day, I had a visitor, and it was Jesus." And when I got out of prison, I took him home with me. <laughs> and that was his, that was his story. That's you know? awesome. And so in, uh, in July of 2002, I was in making a recording, and I just left uh, July 25th. And uh, we were on our way to uh, Jackson, Mississippi, and Sherry was flying in. And so I called Jeff on the phone, and I played the song for him. And, and, uh, and that night, about, I don't know, about 1 o'clock in the morning, I get a call. 
and it's his pastor. And uh, he was hysterical. And I said, what's going on? He said, well, Jeff was laying in bed reading his Bible. And he reached over and grabbed a highlighter and circled a verse, which happened to be in Psalm 130 that says, if you should count iniquity, O God, who could stand? Uh -huh. But there's forgiveness with you that you might be feared. Uh -huh. And let out a wheeze and had a massive heart attack and died. Wow. wow. And, uh, and so, you know, they have five kids together. And, uh, you know, not a lot of money. So a guy in Kansas City put together a benefit to pay for his funeral. And I had preached at our home church that morning. It was 2 o'clock in the afternoon at the Blue Moon Lounge in Blue Springs, Missouri. <laughs> like I fit there, you know. And so I'd preach, I'd, you know, suit, tie, everything. And so it was 2 o'clock in the afternoon. They wanted me to come. And so I walk in and I said, well, you know, they want, said, come on up, we want you to play. And so I said, okay, I'll just sit in and play. They said, oh, no, no, we want to we wanna sing a song that Jeff sang, uh -huh. that Jeff played with. And so I have this song. It's called Love Running After Me, and uh, it's a prodigal son song. Uh -huh. and, uh, and so, you know, I stood up in that environment. I'd never been in an environment like that before as a believer, like I'm going to do gospel music here, you know. And... Uh, and I just said to the crowd, it's like, you know, you can, you know, because I was in a suit and tie, and I'm like, you can tell, you know, Sunday, Sunday, I just came from church. <laughs> and I can tell by looking around, and y'all didn't go to church today. <laughs> you know, and they loved it. Yeah. And so we played this song, and at the last verse, I'm screaming, Jesus, Jesus, will you take me just as I am? Mm. And then, you know, and it goes on, his love came running, you know, and rescued me. And uh, as soon as we got done, one of the guitar players comes up and he just falls on me. And he whispers in my ear and he goes, he says, Rev, you can save me. Mm. And I knew what he, I didn't correct his you theology, right. Right. you know, but I knew what he meant. Yep. And so we invited him to the house the next day. But, but that event showed me that I could go into those environments and share my life and uh, be authentic and people would receive it. Mm. And so from there, uh, a friend of mine wanted to go to Mississippi to the Delta where the blues comes from. And so we're on our motorcycles and we pull into town. We don't know where to go. And uh, there's a, you know, the Clarksdale, Mississippi is famous because that's where the crossroads is at. So if you've seen the movie. That's Robert Johnson, right? Uh, yeah, sure. I'm going to need a Kleenex. Sarah, could you throw those up here? Nice Look toss. At that. You got a water too if you need Yeah, to. thanks. <laughs> and uh, so we pull into town, and there's this monument there that says the crossroads. Of course, they don't know where it is. but And so we're sitting there at the stoplight, and we don't know where to go. And so we're talking, and he says, well, my friend says, well, I got a book, you know, my saddlebag, so let's pull over and park. And so we just pull over, you know, at the intersection. We're digging through this book, trying to figure out where to go, what we want to see. And this old guy pulls up in this pickup truck. Long hair, ponytail, gnarly rebel flag, gun rack, you know, <laughs> total, total redneck, you know. Um, he wasn't like some of y'all that are metro rednectual. Met but, uh, <laughs> what? Metro rednectual. Yeah. Yeah. And so he sticks his head out of his truck and he goes, are you boys here to look at my town? And we're like, yeah, you know, what should we see? And he said, well, you know, this and that. And my friend goes, we're going to get some barbecue. And he goes right there at Abe's at the crossroads. He says, come on, I'll take you over. So he goes over here and we're talking, you know, and he goes, what do you boys do? And I said, well, he's a pastor. I said, but I, I'm a, an evangelist and a blues guitar player. And he goes, well, there's people around here that do that kind of stuff. He goes, do you know Morgan Freeman? I'm like, well, no, but, you know, I know who he is. And he goes, well, he got a place downtown. He said, come on, let's go down here. And so he takes us down to a blues club that Morgan Freeman owns called Ground Zero and introduces everybody. And so to make the story short, he, a few months later, I'm at home and I get an email from him, this guy, the, you know, rebel flag gun rat guy. <laughs> when we went into Abe's, he's like, I got a Thompson in the back here. It's a machine gun. He goes, you want to see it? I'm like, 
Probably not, you know, right here in public. It's like, let me whipping out a submachine gun. But uh, so he sends me this email and he says, I need your phone number. And, I, and so I send him, he calls me and he goes, I've been appointed the first, uh, the chairman of the first ever blues festival to be held at the Crossroads. And I want you to be the first band that we book wow. to play there. And so as we were preparing the next year for the festival. And this is not a Christian event. No, this is, no, this it's is blue, just straight a up. music event. Yeah. And so we're preparing for the festival. And I noticed that some of the people that are playing the festival are playing at Morgan Freeman's. And so I sent him an email and said, Ken, you know, I'd like to do that. Can we do that? And he said, okay. And I said, well, the only time we can do it is Saturday afternoon. And he said, well, I'll check. And so he comes back and he says, well, they're not open on Saturday afternoon. But Morgan said, if you want to play there, they'll open the place up. And so, you know, we figured there'd be like two people there, you know, or something. And we get there and it's full of bikers drinking like there's no tomorrow. And I play the same song that I played at Jeff's memorial service. And and I don't know, you know, how these people are going to respond. Mm. You know, I'm church boy. Right. And uh, And so I get to the part where I'm getting ready to start screaming out the name of Jesus. And I'm thinking, you know, I could kind of just back off the mic and kind of soft sell this and be real quiet. Maybe save my life, <laughs> you know? And, uh, and I thought, no, nah, you know, that ain't, that ain't the way we do things. So I just stepped up and started screaming the name of Jesus. And I hear these chairs rumbling. And I'm like, oh, no, they're rushing the stage. You know, it's like, <laughs> Need some chicken know. wire. Yeah. And, and everybody in the place stands up and applauds Wow! because his name was mentioned there. Mm. And, uh, and so that again, just opened our eyes to see if we can go everywhere, mm. you know, and the thing people say, well, how much persecution do you get in those environments? And I'm like, none. Yeah. And they're like, well, you're, you know, you're compromising the gospel, you know, mm. you're not telling the truth. And I'm like, no, here it is. We respect people. We love people, and that's really all you need to do mm -hmm. for people to have a to have an audience with yeah. people. So from that, then we started being open to those opportunities. But we played it. We had you know somebody called and said, "Hey, I'm doing this thing at Sturgis," and we had been to Sturgis, which is the the largest motorcycle rally right. in the country, probably in the world. Yeah, I think so. I mean, when we played there for their 75th anniversary, which was. Um, I don't know, six or seven years ago, there was 1.2 million people wow. there and, uh, in a town of 6,000. So um, it takes up the whole western Linda half. Back there. Linda, you've been to Sturgis before? Yes, yeah. And, uh, you know, it takes up the whole western half of South Dakota and Wyoming and, you know, all the resources are there. And so, uh, so anyway, that opened the door for us to start going to Sturgis. So we had the stage downtown. And really, it was embarrassing because it looked like a bunch of hillbillies. I mean, it was horrible. But we had this idea. I was taking a nap one day, and of course, Jim Richards will teach you this, that he just taught me this, that you know the most creative times that you'll have is right as you're falling asleep yeah. and right as you're waking up. So I was taking a nap, which I love naps. We're getting nappers in here. Come on, somebody. <laughs> and 2.30, uh, man, I'm ready. Uh, but so I woke up from a nap and I had this idea. It's like, I'm going to, I'm going to create a CD and we're going to call it the bike blessing CD because every biker wants their bike to be prayed over by a pastor or a priest or somebody. And so I'm going to put a prayer on it. 60 second prayer and a bunch of my music and a mine and Sherry's story, an audio of that. And while we're performing, we're going to give these away. And so the first year we took 5,000 and we, I mean, Sherry and the team were giving away about 1200 an hour. And after we were finished, I would walk around the area because you know how it is when you're giving out tracks or something. It's like they're just, you know, 10 yeah, feet away. They're just all over the place. And I'd look in at trash cans and on the street, and I never found one. Mm. And, uh, and then we got responses from all over the world. But from Jim Richards' church, there was a guy named Easy who was a legendary tattoo artist. Yeah. Uh, for his work on Hell's Angels. And so he would come, and he would come to the stage, and he'd go, hey, Jimmy, can I have some CDs? And I'm like, what do you want? He's, he goes, can I fill up my saddlebag? And so, I said, sure, 
So you take a couple hundred CDs and you go straight to the outlaw biker camps and give them away. Which is essentially Hell's Angels outlaw. They're the yeah, one percenters, the, mm -hmm. the rough guys. Yeah, places that I wouldn't go. Yeah. You know? Well, and may, may, may not even be able to get into. No, I wouldn't. And he was able. Um, yeah. And so he came, he'd come back and he'd say, in the first time he did it, he came back and he said, I woke up this morning at the camp and the only thing you can hear in a camp is your CD playing. And I gave one to the president uh, of, the, of the club. And so that opened the door for us to be able to do that. And so one year we're leaving town and I'm thinking, you know, there's all these music venues here. Why aren't we playing at some of those? And my, you know, my thinking is I'll start at the, like the crummiest bottom joint. And I had that thought and I started looking around. And I thought, why would I do that? I'm gonna go to the biggest place here. Mm. You know, I'm gonna start there. They can tell me no and then I'll go on, you know? And and so a place called the Buffalo Chip, which actually is, they got their own zip code now. Really? Yeah. And so it's, you know, 650 acres, um, legendary concert venue, party place. Uh, they call it the best biker party anywhere hmm. and so i emailed them and just was persistent and following up with them and they said yeah you know come and so we went and it was horrible it was really terrible hmm. and uh but we decided you know they, they just weren't prepared logistically for us i mean we were playing it was just terrible and uh but we decided we'd have a good attitude because they were treating us bad and i don't think they were doing it intentionally and we would serve them just like we would anybody else, you know, we were there to serve them. So we mm -hmm. laughed and had a good time and, and, uh, but we weren't coming back, you know, and a couple of years later, the owner, uh, called me and said out of the blue and I was shocked. And he goes, you know, we didn't treat you right mm. last time you were here. And if you come back, we'd like a chance to treat you right. And so they did. And it was great. And we did that for a couple of years. And then he came to us to pay us one time which, you know, isn't an, even close to enough for us to be able to do that event. And he said, you know, if you come back next year, we want to give you a spot on the main stage. And so we said, for sure. So we raised the money and, uh, and went, and they let us open for Willie Nelson and invited us back the next year uh, to open for the Doobie Brothers. So I don't know, it's like Doobie, Willie, you know, it all kind of makes that's sense. A, that's a different kind of glory cloud that floats out of the, <laughs> out of the yeah. bus when you're doing that show. Right. And so that, you know, opened the door for us to do those things. But we've opened, you know, for Willie, for and and, and and there's no Christian art. I mean, I know you wouldn't label yourself a Christian artist, but you're doing gospel music. You're singing about Jesus. Well, they know me as the Reverend Jimmy Bradshaw. Yeah. And but they, I mean, it's not like they bring other Christians in. No, they yeah. don't. But when they like when the, they did the publicity for Willie, I mean, he was top billing, so he got yeah. top. So it was us, another, or it was him, another artist, and me. The Rev. Jimmy and Bradshaw. so all on all the publicity uh, that they did, we were like number three on mm -hmm. the list. And and they you know they've written about me and they know what I do and. All because you were willing to show up That's and right. have a brush ministry, right? And then just and then just keep going and you just serve people and uh, showing up thing. That's what how we how we tell people what we do. Yeah, we the ministry is showing up, mm -hmm. and so and that equates to all of us. So you know the the way that the you know the way that we communicated is Christ in us. Where we go, He goes, and where He goes, stuff happens. And so all we have to do is just show up. And in every opportunity, you know, everything that we have, just like the thing at the crossroads, it's like, you know, we're just there. Yeah. And that, you know, that's where men go to sell their soul to the devil. Right. And uh, For real. Yeah. yeah. From all over the world. I mean, mm -hmm. even today, I mean, there are people from all over the world go there to hope to have a transaction mm -hmm. with the devil. And uh, we showed up there and, the favor of God was there mm. for us. So, so you're also a few more minutes. You're also heavily involved in in prison ministry. Yes, which uh, you connected me with. Uh, is it Mark Mason? Mm -hmm. Mark sends boxes four times a year into a hundred different prisons each time. We, whether you, I've mentioned it here before, uh, my book, my testimony book, Devil Walk. Uh, when I got the rights back, I got about almost three thousand copies. And they've just been sitting either here at the church or in my basement 
and you know most stuff sold online so we just had all these books and uh, you know you connected me with him and so we've been sending about 160 books per quarter that have been going into these prisons with the books that you've been sending and, and, I, and I've heard from a couple different chaplains one chaplain wants 300 copies for all the inmates in his prison in Florida which they've invited me. I haven't even, even mentioned this here yet because I, I don't have the details yet, but because of this, he's invited me to come down and uh, you know speak to their inmates. Right. And you know I, I haven't done a lot of that type of thing, and, and I'm, I'm big on you know being authentic, and I don't want to go down there and, and uh, you know it, it, it's, it's interesting. You, you want to go and, and bring something that's valuable to, to whoever your audience is, and without trying to. You know what I mean? Play a game and just be real with them. You know, you just need to show up. Just show up. Yeah. <laughs> so, but, but, uh, you know, you just, I don't want to talk a little bit about the, the prison ministry. You play, you've played Ellsworth, uh, Ellis. Uh, you, you tell it. I get the names mixed up. Well, Sherry and I started in the 80s. And, and you're still doing prison ministry. Right. You're still going in and. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We started in the 80s. We had a, it's a, Kind of a funny story, but we had a lady that uh, was an assistant to a bunch of priests in a Catholic church in the region. And she wanted us to go to prison with her. And I'm like, no, you know, <laughs> right. I'm not going to do this. But yeah. she just kept insisting that we go. And I wasn't real thrilled about going to prison in the first place, yeah. you know. And, uh, and so finally we said, okay, we'll go. And so we go and we walk into this this dining room kind of thing and they got us all broke up in tables and we're assigned tables to sit at. And so Sherry and I are sitting there and this first girl that walks in, she walks up and she looks down at our name tags and finds her place and she's sitting right across from us. And she looks at, looks at our name tags and looks at me and Sherry and she goes, did you all know I was in here? And I grew up with this girl. I mean, like we, you know, from first grade wow. forward, grew up with this girl. And uh, and so, and I told the, the girl that invited us, like, I'm not going to do anything, you know. But one of their speakers canceled. And so she goes, would you all get up and tell your story? So we got up and shared our story. And the girl, the inmate, she, after we're done, she gets up and she goes, you know, what they're saying is the truth because I wouldn't hang out with them because they were so crazy. <laughs> so, but, but anyway, from that, then we started uh, doing stuff at Leavenworth Federal Penitentiary. And then from that, then we, we were invited in 2001 to do our first event at Ellsworth, which is in central Kansas, Ellsworth, Kansas. And uh, there's 950 men there. And so we go back twice a year. We do an event in the spring or in the early summer. And they, the unique thing about that event is they let all 950 men out at the same time, which they never do because they're segregated by gang, by race or whatever. And they let them all out at the same time we play. And then we go back and we do a Christmas event there as well. And then several other prisons in Kansas. Kansas, um, and I've done, you know, like I've done a ton of prisons here in Georgia and, uh, but Kansas is very unique in that they have seen the fruit of how the gospel impacts uh, those, those men and women. And so they've thrown open the doors at Ellsworth is a unique prison and that the chaplain, who's a close friend of ours, we actually met him when he was incarcerated at Leavenworth. He's a Georgia boy. And, uh, but they actually allowed the chaplain and the warden raised half a million dollars and built a church building inside of the fence in the prison. And we were there last summer, and uh, the warden came up to me, and he pointed at the, the chapel, the Spiritual Life Center, and he said, everything in this prison starts and ends there. Mm. And so the culture is set by what happens mm. by that ministry. And so we, like you, started when the lockup started. Uh, I called it house arrest. Uh, <laughs> we, you know, of course, we travel all the time, so we couldn't travel anymore. Yeah. And so we started using our resources with Mark and then, and then we've since increased that just Christmas, you know, we would do two events in Christmas at Ellsworth and El Dorado, Kansas. El Dorado is a super max, 1,350 men there. And they don't, they couldn't, they couldn't hire enough guards. So they just locked them up in their cells 24 seven. 
which it's bad enough being locked up, but then locked up at the holidays is even worse. And so the chaplain... Um, we, we think it's bad. We can't get good service at a restaurant. Right. These boys are just in a cage right. 24-7. Yeah. Because there's no guards. No guards. And, um, and so the warden, um, or not the warden, but the chaplain, Herbie Harris, he, uh, we were, he called to cancel our event and said, you know, we want to raise the money to give um, a gift to these guys. It was going to cost $9.50 a piece. And that was, the gift was like shampoo, soap, candy, a beef stick, uh, you know. And, uh, and so, you know, he said, we need $7,000 more uh, to be able to do that. And so I just said, well, you know, let me, let me see what I can do. So I sent a text to several churches in the area that should be concerned, you know, yeah. and want to participate because these people are going to get out and go back into their communities. And we were able to raise, we raised $12,300 just like that. Mm. And so that bought the gifts and then it bought them enough equipment to, uh, to send television programming into every cell 24 seven, which, you know, we'll hook you up with that. And, uh, and then our contribution, we sent money, but our contribution was to send 1,350 of our book, uh, Granny Paid for Our Divorce, <laughs> um, to them as a Christmas gift. Look at that picture on there. We were 19 and Sherry was six months pregnant. Look and at that then, mustache. Yeah. <laughs> so what else you got here? Well, tell us about everything you got Okay, here. so don't take your dreams to the grave. We talked about that. And then uh, this book we just finished in May, and this book's called The Little Girl Win. It has a picture of me and this uh, beautiful lady on the back of it who happens to be my daughter, Jessica, who... Who's did, probably watching, I would imagine. Maybe, yeah. yeah. I don't know. They were doing a Christmas oh, with their oh, kids. Oh, that's right. They were in West Virginia. Um, but so Jessica, uh, the thing about our story is, is that uh, we didn't meet her until 2011, and so when she was 38 years old, and uh, so this is and it's a story, it, yeah. it's a tearjerker. Maybe sometime we can come together. And, yeah, uh, that would be awesome. And it's do an that incredible, so, inspiring story of restoration. Yeah, and so uh, the first part of the book is basically her story, and then when it gets to chapter 10, the gray pages, uh, they are ev the words that we used. In texts and emails. The text messages y'all sent back yeah, and forth. Before to, we met face to face. Wow. So the actual words of, that we use, that the Lord used to reconcile our wow. family. And I bet so you've heard some pretty amazing ago. testimonies off of that. People yeah. that have, because there's people, I mean, I know people that hadn't talked to their kids in a long time. Yeah. That was a shocking thing when, when that event happened and we got, you know, we became a family, which in every sense of the word, family. Um, you know, she was here. Our first our first church service together was uh, Easter Sunday, 2011. We were at her house, and uh, she brought me a gift. We'd only we just met, you know, a couple of weeks before, mm. and she brought me a gift with a coffee mug with daddy names on it, and it was full of her favorite candy bar, which kind of an obscure candy bar, zero candy bars. Y'all have those down here? Yeah which she had no way of knowing that was my favorite candy bar. And, uh, and she, we were talking, of course, I was crying. Uh, that's what I did in 2011. Uh, and uh, she reaches up and she puts her hands on my face and she says, Daddy, it's just like you're always here. Wow. And, uh, and that's the way our relationship is. Wow. That's just that healing no power. No loss. No regrets. Yeah. Uh, you know, just, just love. Wow. Praise God. So anyway, Praise God. But we have talked to so many people, and there's, I'm sure there's people here that uh, have that breach in their relationship for whatever reason. And uh, it's amazing because we were shocked how many people have that. Yeah. And uh, we have lots of stories of people, you know, just like you said, we were in a church in West Virginia and uh, together, it was the first time we spent Father's Day together. And uh, 
we told our story, and the first guy to the book table comes out. He's 20. He says, my birthday's tomorrow. I'm 21. Never got to meet my dad. And I text my mother while you were sharing mm. and told her that's what I wanted for my birthday. The next guy that comes out is this, you know, West Virginia farmer, overalls, you know, probably in his late 70s, and he's just shaking, you know. And it wasn't because he was, you know, had Parkinson's or anything. He was just shaking, trembling. Emotional. Would be better. Trembling would be a better descriptive word. And he comes up and he says, you know, he says, I haven't talked to my kids in 25 years. Mm. It is my fault. Mm. And I'm going to see what I can do to reach out. Wow. Man, you got a few of those back there. Maybe some people know somebody in their family or that you just know that could use it. But Yeah, when you get the book, you have to have one of these. <laughs> <laughs> a few of them, maybe. Um, but so everything, all your product back there pretty much goes toward you guys. All your expenses for 100%. ministry, 100% going toward... Uh, the prison ministry and right. just other things that you're doing. So yeah, and the thing. Let me just mention this, and then I'll I'll shut up. But uh, we had this I had this idea last year uh, because we were locked up, yeah, and we were starting to use our resources, you know, sending those, which we're going to continue to do. So I had this idea that we would do, and we would do in prison book signings. And so we're just starting and, and give them away. And give them away. Yeah. yeah. So we just we did one last summer, and uh, and so we'll go. You know, we pre-signed the books, and so we're getting ready to schedule one with the Granny Book um, at a women's prison. And so we'll go and do our inspirational evangelistic event. But then we wanted something that is a follow-up or discipleship orientated. So we'll go. We'll raise the money. We'll buy the books, we'll sign the books, and then we'll give them to everybody that comes. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's that's what these these people are generous people, and these people love. Uh, we do a lot of stuff, missions in Kenya and always looking for opportunities like this. Um, but you buy something off that table, it's most likely going to impact a life. Yes. Maybe maybe result in salvation, save a marriage, restore a family. I mean, you know, these, these are legit seeds that are going out there right. and what making we, an impact. You know, what we started doing in churches. And I'm not just trying to sell books. I'm sure they'll give it to you if you well, can't afford I mean, it. What but, we, what we, what but these we, are evangelists we want to support. Amen. And so what we say is, like, if you want to buy a book, buy a book. But if you want to donate 10 bucks, yeah. there we'll, you go. we'll buy a book. Right. And You'll we'll, buy a book. <laughs> we'll take it to the... We'll take it yeah. and send it into. So on your way out, let's do this. Everybody buy at least one thing, right? And let's just clear everything you got. It's kind of bossy. <laughs> 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 yeah. They know. They know me. You, you're a big cook. You got some rubs, the barbecue rubs. Yeah, yeah. These are from a company near us in Kearney, Missouri, which is the hometown of Jesse James. Um, and they're all like fresh made, non GMO, no caking agents. And so there's no steak rub, brisket rub, there's all purpose rub. Uh, and so they're great stuff if you're a barbecue guy or cooker. Mm. You know, I don't know if y'all know how to do that down here or not. <laughs> I've had Brunswick stew, I ain't a fan. So just. First time he came, I was, we were going to lunch. I said, What you want to eat? He said, Just don't take me to barbecue. Cause I guess barbecue, Kansas City, but oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, we got some Kansas City folks here. Burn-ins all the way. Okay. Burn-ins Burn all the ends. way. Come on now. So uh, we appreciate you coming. We, you know, we love having you and Sherry here. Do you appreciate hearing their story and what they're doing? Um, yeah. You know, I think the purpose of this um, isn't so we can talk about ourselves as much as inspire yeah, right. people in everyday situations that the validity of who you are yeah. and what you do and the people you interface with are really no different than what we do. Mm -hmm. And it's just a matter of you looking for those opportunities, finding them. And showing up. And showing up. You know, it's like with the Bike Blessing CD, it's like, 
It's no different than Paul saying, oh, there's the monument to the unknown God. Let me tell you about that guy. Mm. You know, I right. mean, it was like, well, here's a, you know, here's an opportunity to impact this culture that they respect. That's a spiritual thing. And so, you know, we just sew into that. Yeah. Just take that, yeah. that one thing. And, and in every, you know, the reason why we have the Holy Spirit is be, you know, to have the power of the Holy Spirit is because relationships are so hard. And when you look at the fruit of the Spirit, all of those are relational things. So, you know, love, joy, peace, kindness, you know, temperance, all those things are relational tools. And so we have the Holy Spirit so that we can function relationally in our marriage, in our kid, with our kids, in our family, and in our culture. Mm -hmm. And so you all have that same power. And so in every, in every social interaction that we're in, there's some way that you can sow a seed into that relationship and into those people's heart. And even if it's as simple as, you know, you're going out to the restaurant, your food's late, you can be one of those people that says to the waitress, hey, you know, I got this thing working in me called patience. And it's okay. <laughs> right. And they'll Let always the remember bit. that, yeah. you know. They'll always remember that you were kind and that you were patient and that you weren't like everybody else that was griping and complaining and that you showed them respect and love. And it's so powerful right. because then that opens the door for us to be able to, you know, like, why are you that? Why were you so kind? Right. It's like, you don't have to explain it to people. You don't have to share scripture all the time and do all those things as much as just manifest the reality of who Jesus is in you, wherever you're at. That's right. And if you ain't happy, then, you know, nobody wants to talk to you. <laughs> so that's kind of how that works. And that, you know, and it's so true. I, I was praying about where I'm going in my next few messages next weekend. I'm, I'm talking about being salt and light. And I was thinking about that because a lot of people are trying to figure out, well, what is God's will for me? What should I do? What should I be doing? And I just felt like the Lord said, well, focus on the gifts of the Spirit. Know what they are. Look for opportunities to display those, to trust the Holy Spirit to display those gifts in whatever the setting is, and then watch what happens. Then you'll know how to step into the will of God for you because it's going to open those doors. Yeah, and the, the other thing that I've learned about the Holy Spirit that we've had wrong for so long is that uh, is about conviction mm. in that if you look up conviction in the like Strong's or something, yeah. the first definition is to rebuke sharply with guilt and shame. <laughs> and I'm like, I think they got that one wrong. Yeah, because Jesus came to take that. Right. You know, he took all that. You didn't stuff. see him do that. No. And so the second definition they got right, which is to convince. Mm. And so what's the Holy Spirit doing in the earth? He's convincing people. What's he convincing people of? Everything that Jesus did and said, mm. that that's the truth. And it's not this foreboding, uh, shameful, guilty experience that we made it out to be yeah. as much as it is we get to share the good news with people of what Jesus has done for their situation. Right, And that makes it so much fun because, you know, we're just, you know, we're just out being with people. Well, that's when you get a, a room full of, a bar full of drunk bikers responding favorably to hearing the gospel. Right. Yeah. I mean, one, you know, one time, like we were getting ready to do a prison outreach and uh, what we call the transformation tour in the summer. And I was taking a nap. <laughs> <laughs> and I woke up from the nap and I thought, and I thought, I'm taking offering envelopes to Knuckleheads, you know, this music venue in Kansas City. And I'm like, okay. And so I took the offering envelopes and I'm up there doing my thing. And I'm like, you know, we're getting ready to go to prison and, and we're going to do this concert and our budget's 12000 you know, $500 and 68 cents. And a whole bunch of people wanted to give 68 cents. <laughs> and, uh, but, so I just said that, you know, it's like, here it is. And so the first person that walks up to Sherry is the, the bar, the waitress that's bartending in that at that venue and she walks up with all of her tips and she goes here i wow. want you to take this the next person that came up to sherry said i'm just pay for the whole thing wow 
and paid for the whole deal. And probably were just looking for an opportunity. Right. Or yep. just were inspired and, right. you know, so it's almost you're giving people an opportunity to sew sure. into the, the work. Right. Yeah. And, the, you know, the important point about why I wanted to do this is just to encourage y'all, you know, it's not this, the minister's the big dog, you know, kind of thing. Right. It's that we carry his presence. Everybody. And just like Peter had his shadow and an aura and all those things and, we're the same way, you know. You get around, you get around people that are got a funky attitude. It's like, no, you know, you know, it's like, ooh, dude, you know, I don't want to be around that. But you get around people that are full, really joyful, you know, have the yeah. have righteousness, peace, and joy working in their life. Mm -hmm. It's like everybody's going, yeah, you know, I want to be around that. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, just to encourage y'all in that. Amen. Amen. Uh. I, wa I wonder, I'm sitting here thinking, I almost want to hear another song. Can we do that? I don't know. Did you delete all those tracks back there? We have those, but is 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 Get Out the Boat one you can do without a track, or is that uh, hard to? I don't to, have either, Okay, so. but it's hard to do without a track. Yeah. Three cool. What's a, what's, a, you know, I don't know, what, do you, what would you want to play? I don't know. I'd just get up there and do something. Y'all want to hear, y'all want to hear one more song as we head out? Yeah. Let's do that. Let's let's have one more song. I'm throwing a curveball to the, the sound guys, but they'll they'll knock it out. We'll still have time to go catch the football game. And eat chicken. And eat some chicken. <laughs> yeah, you can just leave it there in that that area. Yeah. Do you want them to play one of those that we got back there already? Or? Well, there's three more. Yeah. Bad religion, yeah, let's do that. Bad religion. <laughs> no. So this is a song that I wrote with my friend Jim Richards. Y'all can dance if you want to. <laughs> And I dedicate this song to every mean preacher I've ever heard and every mean Christian I've ever been around. So if you got it, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> This morning with a crazy vision And I thought it was heaven It was bad religion Well it messed up my mind It made me feel so mean It drove everybody crazy it made them want to scream They cut sharp like a deep incision Killing my friends with my bad religion Well now who's that talking on my television But some mean old preacher with his bad
screamed, I just had to be right. Good stuff, amen. amen. If you got somebody that you feel like would enjoy these songs, buy a CD, get it in their hands. Uh, if you want to, you guys can put up the giving information there. If you want to give, and uh, we're going to give them a nice, healthy offering for coming through that sows into their ministry. And again, I, you know, he said I'm bossy, but I'll just be bossy. Everybody just buy at least one thing. Let's clear off our table so they don't have to go back, and then it goes into actually legit ministry. Amen. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to gather together. We thank you so much for the gift of the Holy Spirit, for the gift of church, that we can come in and encourage one another and be lifted up and inspired and be reminded that we carry your spirit, Lord. And, and none of us are insignificant. We all have the ability to show up. All of us can just step into those opportunities and show kindness and show patience and, and be peaceful and loving and Father, we, we just commit to that in this moment right now. We give you our hearts. We give you our lives. We trust you to use us in simple situations because we want to make an impact for the gospel. And if there's anybody in here today or watching online, you've never said yes to Jesus, it's very easy. You just acknowledge to him, Jesus, I believe that what you did was for me. I believe that there's forgiveness for me and what you've done. I believe God sent you for me to save me. And I say yes. Do you say yes to that? And if you are watching online and you have more questions on that, you can go to our website, forward.church. There's going to be a video that plays at the end of this that shows you, takes you to some articles. We have a free gift there for you. If you need prayer today, Bob, why don't you come on up for us if you would. If anybody needs prayer, slide, your, slide up here. And one more time, show Jimmy, look, Jimmy and Sherry some love for coming. <laughs> this, it might be the only time I say it, but go Chiefs. <laughs> and uh, you guys have a great week. Love you guys. Bless you. Jesus said you must be born again to enter into his kingdom. He's done everything to provide eternal life for you, and you only receive it by grace through faith. And we want to help you be sure in your salvation. You know, maybe you're new to Christianity. Maybe you're discovering things about God for the first time in your life, and you don't really know what it's all about. I've been there, trust me. I wasn't raised in a Christian home. I didn't know anything about God when I got born again and tried to approach the Bible, and it didn't make sense to me. So we want to help you. If you go to forward.church and click on Who is Jesus, we have a simple article on there that explains salvation, everything he did for you, how to begin to read the Bible and start to live a Christian life and incorporate his principles and how to engage the Holy Spirit for empowerment. You know, his grace wants to transform you. His love wants to make you whole. And we want to help you. If you've made the decision to be born again today for the first time, or maybe even a recommitment, and you're just not even sure what to do, how to approach the Bible, reach out to us. Email us at info at forward.church or call our office 770-828-5826. Go to our website, find the article on who is Jesus, and get started. He loves you. He's for you. He will lead you and guide you, and we want to help you. If you'd like to give today, you can give directly at our website, forward.church slash give, or you can text any gift amount to 84321. Thank you so much for your generosity. Would you like to stay connected with us? 
then visit forward.church connect and click online guest. You'll receive texts and emails with links to free resources and notifications when we're going live on Facebook and YouTube. You are invited to join our Facebook group where you can interact with our pastors and our local and online church members. Visit forward.church and click online community under the ministries tab or go to facebook.com slash group slash forward church. Thanks for watching today. I hope you got something helpful out of this message that you can apply to your life. If you did and you like what you heard, we have hundreds of free resources available online at forward.church or on my blog at clintbyers.com. We also have a church YouTube channel. I have a YouTube channel. We have SoundCloud, Spotify, you name it, we have it out there. Go like and subscribe to our social media platforms and share those. You know, it's, it's really an opportunity for evangelism to get these materials out online and you can help us. I would ask you to consider supporting Forward Church financially, but then you can also be a great help by going to these social media platforms, follow the accounts, like and subscribe to the videos that will drive up our viewership and we will reach more people together. Thanks again for watching. Be sure to like our Facebook page and subscribe to our YouTube channel so you don't miss out on any of our new content. We invite you to make the journey. Experience transformation from the heart through our free discipleship resources available at forward.church slash the journey. There you'll find free online courses, recommended reading, and other resources. For tons of free messages and other great resources, go to clintbuyers.com.